So let's jump right into it. And um, so really important things is really just knowing how to um, navigate your portal. So I want to show you a, a few things regarding that and then also and talk about important deadlines. So you want to make sure that you, of course, have activated your account, checking your CSUSB email. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you check a few things. So I'm going to show you how to check a few things on your student portal. And one thing that you want to check, um, this is a new layout, a new look for our student portal this year. So it looks really nice. Um, you really can't mess up too many things on it too. So, you know, just be careful when you're in the financial settings of things. Um, but, you know, this is how you're going to do a lot of things once you are a student at Cal State San Bernardino. So we just want you to get used to um, utilizing your portal. And so one to check um, your to-do list. That's what I want to show you. So you're going to log on to your student portal. You're going to click on documents. And then um, you're going to select access my to-dos. And that's going to show you any important um, admissions deadlines you have coming up, like transcripts, things like that. So very important to check your to-dos. You should be getting emails regarding things as well. So I always tell students, check your CSUSB email and check your to-do list because that's going to help keep you informed. All right. We also want to talk about submitting official transcripts. Important to know before I go into this, um, Partial transcripts, we did ask for official partial transcripts from transfers that was due um, February 16th. Um, we are still accepting transcripts. Hopefully you have already requested those transcripts. We are a couple weeks behind on processing those. So please be patient as we get caught up with that. So if you submitted your transcript last week, no, we have not processed it yet. Um, so again, give us time so we can get caught up with that. Um, once we do process it, it will come off your to-do list. As a transfer student, if you have not submitted your transcript yet, yes, you can still request it, but you need to request it as soon as possible. Why is this important? One, we need to make sure you are eligible to start with us. Two, you can't go to orientation and not have transcripts on file. Um, if you go to orientation and you expect to register for classes, they are not going to be able to advise you on what classes to register for. So that is very important of why we need a partial transcript for transfers. For freshmen, your, your transcript, your final transcripts are going to be due. Everybody's final transcripts are going to be due in July. Um, EOP may have been requesting transcripts as well from high school students, but really the ones that are priority to get those in are those partial transcripts from transfers. And again, please allow time for us. Anytime we get by a deadline, we get, you know, hundreds and thousands of transcripts. So it takes some time for us to get caught up. Okay, now let's talk about submitting transcripts. So, um, and also if you want to check your to-do list, like do I have to submit transcripts? And, then, and once it is processed for transfer students, this will come off your to-do list. And so you'll see if you're taking spring classes, you'll see final transcripts on there. Um, so you'll go ahead and again, log on to your student portal, click on documents, click on more, and then it will um, say submitting transcripts. So we'll give you the deadline again. Everybody has final transcripts that are due in July. Um, right now, we don't plan to cancel anybody for missing a deadline, but the sooner you get them in, the better. Um, we're going to wait to get caught up with everything and see where we're at with the, with the transcripts. We really do prefer electronic transcripts to be submitted to us. So um, this information is on our website too. Um, electronic means from you request it from your current college or university um, or high school. So that means, and again, high schools, we're not asking for transcripts really right now unless it's EOP. But um, us, you emailing us a transcript is not an official transcript. So um, 
you request it from your college or university. Um, they use it generally a third party vendor. A lot of times it's, you know, parchment. The great thing about parchment too, is you get two emails, um, one email that they received your request. And then the second email that they have processed re your request and it has been sent to us. So usually that second email means you're good. The transcripts here, we just need to get to it to process. Um, if you still need to submit the transcripts to us electronically, it's going to go to this email here, admissions apps at csusb.edu. This goes directly to our processing unit that will process the transcripts. Um, and again, don't just email us a transcript from you. It's not considered an official transcript. We do also take physical transcripts. Um, so students are able to drop those off directly to our campuses, our San Bernardino and our Palm Desert campus. Official, though, means it is in a sealed envelope and that seal is not broken. We do need you to write your Coyote ID on that envelope. Uh, we also have Dropbox at our San Bernardino campus, so that ID is very helpful. Um, and you can come directly to our offices at San Bernardino. You would come to University Hall 107. And our Palm Desert campus, you would go to the Mary Stewart Rogers Gateway building inside the lobby to drop them off. You can also mail transcripts as well. Um, this is our least favorite way of, accept, of receiving transcripts just because things can get lost in the mail. So again, a lot of schools are doing electronic transcripts. So that's really the best way to, to submit those transcripts. Easier to track. Um, I would recommend dropping them off in person at this time, especially if you haven't submitted transcripts. But either way, electronic or in person is really the best way. And um, we are a campus that does rolling admissions decisions. What does that mean? That means that we have started setting out decisions since December, January, and we will continue to send out decisions. Most will have decisions by April 1st. So if you don't have an de admissions decision, although I talked with our director today and 90% of students have received admissions decisions. If you don't have a decision, don't freak out. Um, you know, maybe we're waiting for your transcripts to come in. So a decision will come. So, um, in order to um, notify us that you are planning to attend Kelsey Severino, we'll need you to go in and accept your admissions offer. So I'm going to show you how to do that next. That secures your registration spot um, for fall, and then we'll allow you to sign up for orientation, which um, orientation registration will open up tomorrow. So um, we'll talk more about orientation in a little bit, but um, you need to accept your offer first in order to um, register for orientation, which is mandatory. And that is when you're gonna be registering for your classes is that orientation. So very important. Um, keep in mind, it generally takes 24 hours to things to clear the system. So like if you accept your admissions offer today and you um, should be able to register for orientation tomorrow when it opens up. Um, so yeah, generally it will take 24 hours for things to be updated in the system. So in order to accept your admissions offer, again, you will log on to your student portal. And then you will go ahead and click on accept or decline more. Accept your offer. And then again, that's letting us know that you're planning to attend. We no longer have an enrollment confirmation deposit. So it's, again, just letting us know that, yes, I plan to attend. Please secure my orientation and registration spot. So important dates to know. Let's go over that next. So again, um, applications have closed for fall. Um, for our impacted majors, that deadline was November 30th. We did extend our deadline to January 31st for our non-impacted majors. However, and again, just getting this information from our admissions director today. Um, if you're here, you have applied, but maybe you have a friend that missed the deadline. Um, there may be a possibility still that they can apply for fall. They do need to contact us. We do need to see that, in fact, they are eligible 
before um, we can move forward and see if they would be able to put in an application for this fall. So important to know that if you had a friend or um, someone that missed that deadline. Um, but again, we want to make sure they're eligible. Um, as I mentioned, December through April, we are making admissions decisions based off self-reported information. So you're based off your application. And um, if you don't have a decision yet, again, you should hopefully get a decision soon. Um, our partial transcript deadline for transfer students, again, was February 16th. If you didn't get that transcript in, please get it in as soon as possible. Very important that you need that for orientation. Um, again, we're not going to hear more about financial aid in that, but April 2nd is the priority deadline for our FAFSA and our California Dream Act application, as well as our scholarship application. So um, make sure now I know FAFSA deadline will be uh, will accept beyond April 2nd. However, priority deadline is April 2nd. You, you always want to try to meet those priority deadlines, especially to be considered for certain types of aid. So we'll hear more about that um, in a bit. And so make sure you do your FAFSA or your California Dream Act. And again, apply for scholarships. So important to apply for our scholarships. And then um, the deadline to accept your admissions offer, we have extended that. It's generally in May. Um, the deadline will be June 1st, but just again, know that you cannot sign up for orientation unless you have accepted your admissions offer yet. And um, also, if you're interested in living on campus, um, our housing application deadline will be May 19th. Um, we do recommend to fill out the housing application early. At time when you fill it out early, sometimes you can get a um, housing discount. So that's always nice. And then our orientations will take place in the summer. So in June for our first year students and in July for our transfer students. And again, um, orientation registration will open up tomorrow. We always recommend, and again, this is mandatory, as you can see there in red. This is mandatory. This is how you are going to get introduced to our campus, how things work at Cal State San Bernardino, uh, what resources we have, and again, most importantly, registering for your fall classes. So this is mandatory. This is generally in person. For high school students, we are going to back to a two-day orientation um, and for our transfer students, it will be one day, all day. So we always recommend to sign up for an early orientation because the sooner you do, the better, the sooner you'll be able to um, sign up for your classes as well. And then our final transcript deadline, so everybody will be submitting transcripts, and that is July 15th. The sooner you get us those transcripts, definitely the better. And again, official transcripts. For transfer students, if you um, have already completed all your courses and are not taking spring classes, then you will have already submitted a, a final transcript. But high school students, we need that graduation date posted um, on your transcript and all grades posted. As well as transfer students, we need all those grades posted to be considered a final transcript. All right. And then we have some... Um, events coming up, in-person events that will also be helpful um, to make sure that this is the right fit for you um, in your college journey. And so uh, my colleagues can put our um, events website in the chat at our Plum Desert campus. We have our future Yodis night coming up on March 28th. Uh, we have two CSUSB day on April 13th. This is a Saturday. Um, and this is for admitted students. Um, a lot of great information going on that day as well. Um, and then April 27th is our Bay event, Black and Educated event. Um, and then next step, similar to what we're doing today, we go out to your schools as well, local schools. Again, we will do virtual ones next month uh, in March and April as well. So we will continue doing these next step workshops. And then just some resources 
Um, of course, our financial aid office, um, orientation, all of these are very super important departments. So you want to make sure that you're connecting with them. So their contacts here as well. Take a tour of our campus. This year, we're very excited to offer tours for our admitted students. So these are definitely different than our general tours. It's going to be by college. So you're going to get information regarding your college, your major resources that are specific to your interests. So this is very exciting. We're excited to roll this out. So please check your emails and sign up for these tours if you are interested. I believe we had our first one today for admitted students. So again, this is something new that we're doing and we're really excited to team up with our colleges and our faculty for this. So Mondays will be Arts and Letters College. Tuesdays will be business, Wednesdays will be our social behavioral sciences, and Thursdays will be our natural sciences. So again, information, if you've been accepted, um, will have been sent out to you. So if you're interested in these tours, please sign up. Because this is going to be very specific compared to our general tours, which our general tours are great too. So if you haven't been to our campus before, please come visit. We have um, amazing general tours. Come check us out. Um, we offer Saturday tours and Spanish tours as well. So please feel free to bring your families. And also at, at a lot of our events, um, like Bay and um, True CSUSB, we generally do campus tours on during those events as well. And some final tips. So again, make sure that if you've been admitted, go in and accept your admissions offer so you can register for orientation, check your to-do list, check your CSUSB email as well. A lot of important information is going there. Make sure to submit your final official transcripts as soon as they are available. Attend an early orientation um, and optional things that are very helpful. Attend to CSUSB day, take a campus tour, and apply for scholarships. We have a lot of scholarships for students attending CSUSB, so please apply for those. And um, today, too, we were sending out a text message to admitted students, so um, please check that out. If Check your phones. You may have gotten a text from us today. And um, as I mentioned, orientation registration opens up tomorrow starting in March for freshmen and transfer students. All right. And here's our general um, more info email. And if you have a, a question, please feel free to call us. Our 537-5188. We'll put this in the chat for you as well. And I want to, of course, turn it over to Francisco to go over financial aid information. Again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will have time at the end for questions as well. Okay. So to get started again, my name is Francisco Burgos, like we mentioned. Um, I'm gonna be going over next steps for financial aid. Um, so to start, I wanna go over this financial aid brochure. I do think this is a good resource for a lot of students to have. So if you can go ahead and scan this, screenshot this and get back to it a little bit later, that works too. Um, one thing I will say with this um, with this brochure is it's made for students to be able to see um, anything that they want to see with financial aid in terms of steps that they have to do for the financial aid process, um, any information about frequently asked questions, maybe any additional resources like the um, financial aid and scholarships page or the scholarship application, as well as any of our social media handles. There's also information about other uh, partners on campus like admissions, like housing, like student financial services. So anything that is underlined on this brochure is hyperlinked, meaning that you can click on it and it'll take you where you want to go. So again, I'll come back to this. So I wouldn't worry too much about trying to get it now, but um, again, we'll, we'll come back to this if anybody needs it. So I did want to start off with this financial aid timeline. At the top, you see it says all months subject to change. There has been a lot of changes with financial aid and just the financial aid process in general. So one thing we wanted to say about this is that some of this might change, some of it might not, but the first part will not change, right? So December through April, that is when students have the opportunity to complete the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application. Uh, so we recommend that students please complete it before the priority deadline of April 2nd. Um, 
The reason why is because in the state of California, if you're able to submit it before, you might be able to qualify for the Cal Grant, and usually the Cal Grant is able to pay for your tuition. So we highly recommend to try to submit your application before that priority deadline. And then from March through April, um, this is when we will begin to receive financial aid applications. Again, because everything got released so late, a lot of it is out of our control, or we're not able to get applications earlier like we would normally during financial aid season. So we're going to be receiving applications around the middle of March into April. And then, like Lucia mentioned, she mentioned to-do lists and holds. One thing that we always try to emphasize to students is to please take care of your to-do lists and holds items, because if they are not completed by the time you start, in, let's say, for example, August, your financial aid will not get dispersed, and then your classes will not be able to get paid, and then your classes will get dropped. So we would never want that for anybody. So please make sure that you check those items because it can be something very simple, and you can get it done within a couple of days. So please make sure that you double check that, because um, if not, your financial aid is going to be really hard to get to you. So keep that in mind. Since the application got pushed back a little bit, that also means our financial aid awarding process is going to be a little bit later in this year. So unfortunately, we will not be able to get students their financial aid award until middle of May um, and maybe pushing into June. So that's when students are going to be able to see how much financial aid they're going to be getting, how much free money, how much loans they're offered, stuff like that. So I'll talk more about what a financial aid package looks like and where to find it, but that's a really important thing. And then from May through July, this is a really important one um, for both first-time freshmen and transfer students. This is when students should begin to choose and create their Cal Grant um, account. So that would be a Web Grants for Students account. We'll talk more about that later, but I can't tell you how much I see this at orientation that students don't do. So you will see me again at orientation. I promise you, you will see me again. So please make sure that you complete this just because this is a really big step for a lot of people that people don't do. So please make sure you take a look at that when you get the chance. So some of the changes, I wanted to highlight some of the changes to the FAFSA. There's a video after this that we won't have to watch, but these are some of the changes again. April 2nd is the deadline for both the FAFSA and the California Dream Act. There's a new onboarding experience, right? Where it's gonna be the student completing their portion first, and then they'll send an invite to their contributor they'll complete their portion and then they're done. So we'll talk more about that right now, uh, but I did wanna go over what a contributor is and who they are not. So a contributor on the application is pretty much referring to anybody that is the student, a student spouse, their parent that's a, either biological or adoptive or a step parent, right? So pretty much anybody that is permanent, permanent in their life right now, as opposed to a con who a contributor is not, are grandparents, so grandpa, grandma, foster parents, legal guardians, brothers or sisters, aunts or uncles, even if they helped you and helped raise you, right? The reason why is because they are not permanent in terms of being um, adoptive or biological parents. So they will not be included on the application. It will strictly be adoptive parents or biological parents or any step parents, okay? So for this part, what you need to know is the way it works this year is a student will complete their portion on the FAFSA after they complete it, there'll be a portion on there where it asks them to invite their contributor. So they're gonna invite their contributor and then it'll send an invitation to them afterwards. And then the contributor will accept that invitation so they can complete their portion, right? So that's why I mentioned that here, students or parents invite contributors to complete their portion by entering social security number, date of birth and email address. Uh, we'll talk about some of the common issues just because again, there's a lot of common issues and we'll talk more about that. Um, but then on here, the last part's pretty much the same that they need to contribute to the application. So for those of you that um, are parents that are on here, or if there are parents joining students, this is what a parent will see after they've been invited by their student or their child. It'll say there's a pending invitation and they can go ahead and view my activity and it'll look something like this, right? So let's say, for example, I'm the student and this says Francisco wants your help on FAFSA form. Francisco has identified you as a parent on their FAFSA form. Parents are required to provide their financial information. So that's what parents will see. They will accept the invitation and then continue to the next portion. So in here, I do want to provide a couple brief tips that I think would be really helpful for folks. So on this application, students are going to have an option to invite their parents. One thing I wanted to say now 
If you have parents that are married and filing joint taxes, you only need to invite one parent and only one parent and that's it. Um, if they are married filing separate taxes, then you have to invite both parents and they both have to contribute to it. One thing I will say about this is one thing about this part in the application is it's very tedious where say, for example, my dad's name is Francisco Burgos as well. You need to make sure there's no spaces at the end of the O if you're typing in Francisco. And then for the last name, you need to make sure there's no spaces at the end of the S. If there is a space, I promise you, it won't let you continue. So please make sure that you double check that. Um, again, the biggest issue that I have been seeing is if you have a student that has parents without a social security number, this year it's supposed to be that they are able to sign electronically through an FSA ID. But for some reason right now, there's no solution for parents that don't have a social. Um, they're not able to contribute or move on in any way. However, there will be a permanent fix coming in the middle of March. So what I would recommend to folks and families that have parents without socials, wait for this permanent fix to come around, because once it comes around, you should be able to complete your application. So please make sure that you wait until then, uh, because for now, you won't be able to do anything, unfortunately. Again, I'm just a messenger, um, so please don't get mad at me. That is through the Department of Education. Lastly, I will say for the email address, you want to make sure that the email address you're putting on here is the one that matches to the FSA ID, because if not, it will not send the invitation. So you want to make sure that it matches. So sometimes parents have FSA IDs that are pretty old. If they have an old email address that they haven't accessed in a long time, make sure that they find it because you need to make sure it's the same exact one or else it will not send the invitation. So that's one thing I will say about that part there. So this is what it's going to look like. So for the contributors, so the parent that's either biological or adoptive, it'll show on here that they'll receive an email informing them, right, that they've been identified. So it'll look something like this. And then from there, if they don't have an account, they'll create one. But if they have one, they'll log in. They'll accept the invitation. They'll fill out the information financially. And then they'll submit. And then the application is done. So that's pretty much it. This part is specifically for Students, so if you're a first time freshman, meaning you're a high school senior right now, this is exactly what it's going to look like for you. So you can take a picture of this and I would highly take a, recommend to take a picture of this. So since you're going to be a first time freshman, you're going to click on first time freshman and then you will not be, you will not have your first bachelor's degree by the time you begin 24, 25 school year. For my transfer students, if you're coming in as a junior, right, as a transfer student, that's going to be a junior, you're going to put other undergraduate and beyond and then press that one. Um, if you're coming for your second bachelor's degree, you can put yes, but if you're coming for your first bachelor's degree, you're going to go ahead and put no as well, and then continue to the next portion. So please take a picture of this just because this will be helpful for you when filling out the FAFSA. Another thing on the application is this year, um, instead of looking through your documents and having to manually input everything, what's nice about this year is it lets you consent to have your tax information transferred in. So what this means is all you have to do is say, yes, I provide consent to have my federal direct um, data exchanged into the FAFSA, and it'll transfer over your adjusted gross income, your total income, anything else that you would need to put onto the FAFSA from years prior, it does it automatically for you. So it's actually really nice just because it's much quicker when it works. So and what I mean by when it works is if your parents have a social and not, there's no errors on your end. What I will say about this one, for this one, please start off by answering no, and I'll explain why. This question is a question I have seen the most people get wrong. Um, so I have seen a lot of students get this part wrong because they say yes to this first portion where it says, are the student's parents unwilling to provide the information, but the student doesn't have an unusual circumstance? Students will see the first part where it says, my parents are unwilling to provide the information and think, yes, they are not able to give it to me, I'm gonna click yes. If you click yes to this question, you are saying that you cannot get your parents' information at all whatsoever. Okay, most of the time that's not true, but if you aren't able to get it, then again, you would choose yes. For most students, if they live with their parents and they talk to their parents every day and can get their financial information, they would click on no, meaning that they do not have an unusual circumstance or are not able to get their parents' information. So just to put no, and if anything changes, you can put yes. But this is the question a lot of people have been getting wrong. Please put no to start off. If your mind changes, then you can put yes. And then we have the California Dream Act, right? So the California Dream Act, 
This is for students that are eligible undocumented students, right? So there's different groups of undocumented students. Some of them are eligible, some of them are not, really depending on their um, citizenship status. So that's another application that students are able to do if they qualify. This is a picture I would have everybody take a picture of. So now that you know if you are going to be coming to CSUSB, you can create your Web Grants for Students account, and this is where you would claim your Cal Grant. So the process to create your account looks exactly the same for both transfers and first-year students. You would fill out this portion right here where it asks you for your social security number if you're a citizen. If you did a California Dream Act, you'll get a Dream Act ID, um, and then you'll do a username and then put your other personal identifiers. You would do this after you've done your FAFSA or your California Dream Act. But again, I would wait till May, June, or July to do this part. If you have two last names by any chance and it doesn't fit on here, just put what does fit, right? So say, for example, my last name is Burgos Garcia. If it cuts it off at the C on Garcia, then that's fine. Just continue putting the rest of your information. Please make sure that this is correct because I can't tell you how many students get this part wrong. So please make sure that you do that correctly. So for first time students or first time freshmen, this is literally all you have to do. The last step is already done for you by your high school counselors where they'll send in your GPA. The only thing you need to do is create your Web Grants for Students account and then confirm CSUSB as your school of attendance and you're good to go and that's it. For my transfer students, um, your college GPA which should have been sent already by your college, by your community college. Again, same first step, you would complete the Web Grants for Students account. The second step is a little bit different. You would have to do a to-do list. On that to-do list, it'll show you a transfer entitlement award. You're only able to get it if you're at a 2.4 GPA and above, and then you meet the income threshold. So you'll see it on your Web Grants for Students account if you're able to get it. But again, you won't see any of this stuff until around May, June, or July. So just keep an eye on that. But if you can create your account, please do so. Now we get into just general financial aid information, right? So we have grants and then we have loans. Some of these examples include Pell Grant. That's usually what you're eligible for if you do the FAFSA. Then you have State University Grant, which is university-based. And then you have a Cal Grant, which is state-based. So a couple of different grants. The things about grants, it's automatically accepted because it is free money, right? So we all love free money, right? Yay. Loans, however... Uh, one thing I like to do in person is ask students how many of you are scared to take out loans and everybody's hands go up, including mine, right? Loans can be scary and we understand that, but we want to explain loans a little bit more just so that you can get a general understanding of how they work. So in order to take out loans, you have to do something called a loan entrance counseling. Pretty much what that is, it's, it's explains to you what a loan is, how interest rates work, paying it back on time, um, and so on and so forth. After you do that loan entrance counseling, you have to sign a master promissory note indicating that you promise to pay back the loan over a span of 10 years um, and that's it and then from there you can take out loans on your my coyote but there's two different kinds of loans and we'll talk about those really briefly so you have subsidized loans and then unsubsidized loans they sound very similar i don't know who decided to word it that way but they're very similar in terms of how they're worded but very different in how they act if you are going to take out a loan and you had the option to take out one between the two i would recommend to take out subsidized loan because it has a grace period. In this grace period, your interest doesn't start until six months after you graduate. As opposed to unsubsidized, that interest will start immediately after your loan is dispersed to you. So after your loan is dispersed to you, say for example, on the first day of school, it is dispersed to you, that is when your interest rate starts. So please be aware that that one interest starts right away. And then this is my favorite part of the application. Again, Financial aid applications and financial aid packages go hand in hand. So in order to get a financial aid package, you have to do your financial aid applications. Um, so on here, right, it'll tell you exactly what you're being offered, whether it's grants, loans, scholarships, whatever it might be. And it'll let you know what you have. What I recommend to do is to compare your award letter to your costs. So meaning tuition, housing fees, if you're going to live on campus, transportation, and so on. Um, again, on here, usually they're released in March and April, but because of some of the changes, it's going to be pushed back to around mid-May to June. So just be aware of that. This is what it looks like. So it'll look something like this. These are two different students. So on the left side, we have a student that was offered grants and scholarships, so all free money. And it shows the year amount as well as per semester. 
So again, if you want to break it down by semester, you can look up tuition costs. If you want to look it up by year, you can do that as well. On the right side, we have a student that was offered grants, scholarships, and loans. That's usually the vast majority of students where they'll be offered a combination of grants, scholarships, and loans. Um, you don't have to take out loans. Again, you don't have to take them out, but if you choose to, please do so. Um, only take out what you need, not what you're offered. You don't need everything that you're offered. Um, and that's a little bit about financial aid packages. They're pretty straightforward, but if you ever do need help with anything, you can come to our office and we can explain it more to you. So in order to get to this page, how do you do it? You would log on to your My Coyote. I'm going to show you two different ways. So you can log on to your My Coyote, and then it'll look something like this, and then you'll click on your Student Center. Once you click on your Student Center, it'll take you here. And this is what your Student Center looks like. They might change this. I know they're working on that whole process, but I really like the Student Center layout just because it shows you your classes, it'll show you your holds, and then it'll show you your to-do list items. Again, please make sure you get comfortable with this because this shows you everything you need to know. If you have an account balance and your anticipated financial aid, it'll show you here, but then you also have your direct deposit and payment plans if you wanna do that, or you can choose to view your financial aid or accept decline your awards like your loans. That's where you can do it. Another way to get here and to see financial aid specifically is you again, go to your My Coyote and then click on the My Financial Style. From here, you'll go to view my financial aid. And folks, for those of you interested in the CSUSB scholarship site, it is on this section here. So I highlighted it there for you. So if you wanna look at your financial aid, you'll click on view my financial aid. It'll take you here. Right now it's saying 2024, cause that's the semester that we're in, but for all of you, it's gonna be 2025. You would click on that year and then it'll look something like this, right? Where it'll show you the year and then break down per semester. Okay. Um, one thing I recommend to do is look at the college financing plan, just because it'll kind of show you more um, in terms of numbers. So it'll show you your cost of attendance, maybe any tuition and fees that you have to look at. That's a really good option to take a look at, just because it is helpful to kind of get a general understanding of what you owe. So the way it works for disbursements, I know for those of you in community college, it might work a little bit different, but here at CSUSB, we usually disperse twice a year. Um, in terms of spring semester and fall semester. So January, uh, January 10th was for this past spring semester, so what we're in now. August 14th is going to be for fall 2024. So remember how we said about the holds and to-do list items? You want to make sure you get rid of those before August 14th, so your financial aid, smooth sailing, nothing gets in the way of that. And then satisfactory academic progress. For the first time freshman, all you have to do is meet 2.0 GPA and pass 70% of your attempted units, just because you won't reach 180 units until a couple of years later. Um, for my transfer students, if you are around this threshold, you wanna make sure you come talk to us because if you are, you will fail SAP every time, even if you get a 4.0. So you still have to meet these requirements if you're a transfer student. I know sometimes transfer students come in with a lot of units. So if you are around this threshold, please let us know so we can try to help you out with anything. The last thing that I have for all of you is these are our financial aid workshops. I host these. Um, so we have a couple coming up on March 7th, 21st, and 28th for the FAFSA. And then we have two for the California Dream Act, March 13th and March 27th. Everybody's welcome to join. If you want to bring a parent, please do. And that's some of our information. Again, we can share that later, but if you want to take a picture of this, I recommend to do so now. Um, if not, that is everything that I have for all of you. So. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and maybe we can take some cue.